This morning, God bless you for being in the house of the Lord, and we're looking forward to a great day today, and I'm excited about what the Lord has for us in this hour, Amen. and I'm asking him to work in our hearts in a great way, and you may be wondering, I wonder why we sang a patriotic hymn, well, Tuesday is the 11th of September, and I know we're 11 years removed from the terrorist attacks in Washington and the World Trade Center, uh, but uh, I think about that day, and it was called, or has been called, I don't think it's designated as a national holiday yet, but it's been called Patriot Day, and uh, thank God for America, the country that we live in, and uh, I'm glad our God loves all people, but I'm glad that we had the privilege uh, to be born in this nation, and what it stands for, and what it represents, and we need to pray for our nation, and I think you know that, and I trust you have been praying for our nation. And not just in an election season, but all the time, we need to pray for our nation. And I trust that you'll be doing that. Let's pray and ask God's blessing on this service, that God would speak to hearts, and if there's any that doesn't know Christ, they'd come to know Christ. And that all things, he'd be lifted up. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for the privilege we have to be here this morning. Lord, I thank you for those who've gathered here in this room, Lord. Uh, we've come to worship thee. And uh, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be stayed upon thee as we have opportunity to enter into this worship service. Lord, I pray that we would do that 
and that our worship lord would be as you have said in your word it would be in spirit through the spirit of god and in truth and lord we thank you that we have the truth we're not looking for the truth anymore we have the truth found in your word and i pray that you would guide us into your truth and as you prayed in the garden sanctify us through your truth and lord i pray you do a great work in our hearts bless as the choir sings in just a moment uh, lord speak to hearts through the song prepare our hearts to receive the word of god in just a little bit as we have opportunity to take the hymn books as a congregation again in just a few moments help us to sing out as unto thee and then as we give lord uh, back what you've given to us may we give cheerfully uh, a heart that loves you and desires to see your work uh, uh, lord progress forward in this place and around the world lord i pray that you bless those that we support around the world and those here in our own country as some have already met this day some are yet to meet and lord i pray that you would guide and direct save souls work in hearts and lives we love you and thank you for what you've done for us uh, lord we we just offer this meeting to you and lord we want to be led of your holy spirit guide us we pray in everything that's said and done in jesus name amen, amen. you may be seated once again please and turn to hymn number 160 crown him with many crowns and would you stand please everyone together let us sing all verses of one hymn number 160 <laughs>
Amen. Please be seated. Well, amen. Very good. Kevin, if you want to come on up to the platform here. Gentlemen, you can come. If you're visiting with us today at Calvary Independent Baptist Church, God bless you for being here. These men want to put a packet of information in your hand. If you'll raise your hand as they make their way back to you. I've already seen some folks visiting with us, had an opportunity to meet some of them, and so glad you're in the service here today. There's a card on the inside. If you'd fill it out, leave it with us in the offering plate. We'll have a record of your visit, and uh, that'll be great. And that's the only thing we ask visitors to place in the offering plate is that card, just to let us know you visited with us today. And God bless you for being here at Calvary Independent Baptist Church. Uh, Kevin Singles is a volunteer in the fire department here in Coryville, and you see he is in, in his dress uniform here today in remembrance of September 11th, and he has something he wanted to share about that day and folks he knows associated with that day up in New York, and he asked me the other day if, it, if he could share something, and I said, sure, come ahead and do that, and so he's going to come ahead and do that this time. <clears throat> I do want to thank the pastor for letting me share a few things about uh, September 11th. I have a kind of a personal uh, connection there. A friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, and he was our best man at our wedding, Sean Halper. Um, he was driving the one engine that day and uh, from Brooklyn, which is only in the proximity of about six blocks away from the World Trade Center. And they were doing the alarm when the second alarm came in as the battalion chief that was there first transmitted a 1076, which is a high rise assignment. And when they got there, he dropped the five fellows off that were with him. And his assignment was to, to go find a serviceable hydrant to battle the fire. And when he dropped those five guys off, that was the last that he saw them alive that day. And their names were <coughs> Captain Anthony Jovic, Anthony Rodriguez, Michael Raguso, Chris Regenhardt, and Ronnie Henderson, which they worked together for a few years together. And I have a quote here from Edward F. Croker, Chief of Department in the City of New York from 1899 to 1911. And this has to do with the heart and the ambition that every New York City fireman, every fireman probably in this whole entire world have the same ambition that this fella did back in the 1900s. I have no ambition in this world but one, and that is to be a fireman. The position may, in the eyes of some, appear to be a lowly one. But we who know the work which the fireman has to do believe that his is a noble calling. Under the impulse, or excuse me, our proudest moment is to save lives. Under the impulse of such thoughts, the nobility of the occupation thrills us and stimulates us to the deeds of daring, even of a supreme sacrifice. And that's what I have to share. And the feeling I have for it, and I, for each and every one of us, is it's just a part of us. It's just what we do. It's who we are, no matter what. That's who we are. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. We appreciate your uh, service in our local fire department. Do we have any other first responders here, or anybody that works in fire department or works in those type of things? Even auxiliary, any of you ladies? got some auxiliary ladies around here, don't we? Maybe they're out helping in other places, but uh, we're thankful for their service and the res service of the first responders. And uh, of course, we have many who uh, have served our country in the past in the military, and those attacks brought about, of course, two, two individual wars we've been fighting and uh, continue to do so. If you, uh, just, just quickly, I won't ask you to name your branch, but if you served in the military, would you just stand quickly for us? Anyone like that? Yes, we have several around the room, and we appreciate their service. And uh, Kerry, it's good to see him. He's currently serving in the Marine Corps, and I'm glad that he's here with us today. God bless you. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you for your service as well. If you have a bulletin there, if you take it out and uh, look at it with me there, I want to make just a few announcements here uh, this morning, remind you of a few things. 
And uh, let me encourage you to make plans to stay. I trust you've already done so. Make plans to stay for our Sunday school picnic. And uh, that will begin immediately after the service here this morning. And uh, we'll go down and meet down in the... Um, we'll have a word of prayer here for the food. And we'll meet down uh, under the trees there uh, in the grove. And uh, look forward to a great time together here this afternoon. Our service it will be changed, of course. We won't have our normal 6.30 service in the evening. The service will be at 3.30, and that's just a little bit of change even. We, we bumped it just a little bit later from 3 o'clock. 3.30, and uh, that'll be this afternoon. Uh, let me encourage you to stay and uh, be a part of that service. It won't be a long service. That's the Baptist preacher's famous last words, right? It won't be a long service, but I don't plan on it being a long service anyway. But I want to encourage you. At least I believe the weather's going to cooperate with us. It's supposed to be nice outside, and uh, we praise the Lord for that. And uh, trust, like I say, even if you're visiting with us, you're welcome to stay. I'm sure there'll be plenty of food to eat, and uh, we'll look forward to a great time of fellowship together. Board members, let me remind you concerning our meeting, that'll be next Sunday, 445, and that's uh, a little bit before the service, of course, next Sunday afternoon. Let me remind you concerning that. Uh, the fair outreach is on Wednesday the 19th, Thursday the 20th and Friday the 21st, and let me encourage you, if you haven't signed up for that, that you'd sign up for it, help us out there, and uh, there at the booth, there's two-hour time slots, we have a few more filled out, and some yet to fill, and if you could help us with that, that'd be a great uh, blessing there. Also, if you took some of those packets, all the, um, all the bags were depleted on Wednesday night, which is a good thing, but we didn't have every item that everybody needed, so if you need those brown cards that are informational cards about the church. There's a whole stack of them out there now that you can use. There's also uh, candy out there you can use to put in the um, put in the packets there. And uh, let's start with just one piece at the time for the time being, and we'll see. Maybe we can add a second one. We'll see how much candy's out there. And uh, if you want to help us with that, that will uh, be great. Ladies, if you're interested in the ladies' conference, this will be held. Uh, they didn't have it last year, but they're holding it again this year. Uh, this is held up at the Heritage Baptist Church up in Wallingford, Connecticut. And uh, Pastor Bish has been here preaching our revival, spring revival, two years ago. This is uh, that very church, and uh, that's where my uh, in-laws attend as well, members there. And uh, that will be on Saturday the 27th. If you're interested in that, if you want to speak with my wife about that, she can give you some more details, departure and returning and those types of things. And uh, that will be on Saturday, October the 27th. Uh, some upcoming events here. You see the Salanco School of the Bible kicks off next Monday evening, a week from tomorrow. And that will begin at 7 o'clock. And uh, we're looking forward to that. If you have any questions concerning that, you can see me about that. Our ministry at the Presbyterian Retirement Community is Tuesday the 25th. And then men, our prayer breakfast will be on Saturday morning, October the 6th. I trust you'll make uh, plans for all of these. On the back, you see some... Prayer requests that are listed here, I trust you remember these folks in prayer. Be praying for Bill Johnson. He's recovering uh, from his back surgery and be praying for him that God would bring healing there in his body. You see our attendance and offering totals from last Sunday, our Sparker Grace report from the previous Thursday evening. Uh, our shutter of the week is Adelaide Kelly. Her address and information are given for you there. In our mystery of the week, we read the letter in the Sunday School Hour. We're praying for the Heralds and they're serving over in uh, Peru, uh, South America. Now, one other thing, and uh, you gentlemen in the back, you can help me with this. There's a little insert out in the Welcome Center. It says uh, 30 days of prayer, if you want to help me with that. I handed this out on Wednesday evening, and I made more copies, and I think we'll probably be able to cover, cover everyone with it. And if you weren't here on Wednesday evening, I want to make sure you get a copy of this. I heard a message on Wednesday uh, during the day. And it was a message concerning the prophet Daniel and how he kept his windows open towards heaven. And it was a message about prayer. And it was a great message. And then at the end of that message, the preacher uh, handed out this, uh, this little insert here, this little help guide, 30 days of prayer. And there's a prayer emphasis for every day of the month. In other words, most days of the month have 30. Some have 31. And... Uh, you can add your own emphasis on those 30, those ones that has 31 days. And, uh, but I want to encourage you to use it, take it, and uh, nothing is dynamic unless it's specific. And uh, so here's an emphasis for that. So if you gentlemen would, wouldn't mind coming forward there, and uh, if you didn't get one of these, they're going to come all the way to the front and then work their way back. If you didn't get one of these, if you'd raise your hand, we want to make sure you get one.
you weren't here on Wednesday evening, you didn't get one. And so if you weren't here, make sure and raise your hand so we can put this in your hand. And uh, that'll be great. And I want to encourage you to use it. And uh, how many of you get things and they go in somewhere, maybe your Bible or something else, you know, and they get tucked away or they get stacked on the counter? I remember when I was a boy, there must have been 10,000 papers that rose on the counter sometimes, you know. So well, put that over there, you know, put that over there, put that over there, you know. And uh, so don't stick that, don't stick this in one of them piles, you know, because it'll get lost somewhere. And uh, so put it wherever you, you keep your prayer list or where you pray or whatever the case may be uh, so you can use it. And uh, if you don't use it, you lose it, right? That goes with many things, no doubt about that. There's a new sword of the Lord available for you as well. It's dated from the 31st of August. And uh, if you haven't picked that up, there may be some left. We had them out there on Wednesday evening. I don't know if other folks picked them up or not. But I would encourage you to do that. We're going to sing a little chorus together, the first chorus there in your chorus book, Glory to God, Hallelujah. If you'll stand, we're going to sing it together. The very first chorus, Glory to God, Hallelujah. <laughs> Never, never weary of the grand old song. Let it run, hallelujah. We can sing it loud as ever with our faith more strong. Let it run, hallelujah. Oh, the children of the Lord have a right to shout and sing for the world's growing bright and our soul. second verse we are lost amid the rapture of redeeming love here we go we are lost amid the rapture of redeeming love God, hallelujah. we are rising on the pinion to the hills above children of the Lord have a right to shout and sing, for the way is growing bright and our souls are on the wing. We are going by and by to the palace of the King. Wait God, hallelujah. Very good. Winnie's going to play a little bit through there. Greet some of their next to it. Tell me, glad to see him here today. your way back. We'll sing those third and fourth verses there. We are going to a palace that is built of gold. Glory to God. Hallelujah. For the king in all his splendor we shall soon behold. Glory to God. Hallelujah. On that third verse, here we go. We are going to a palace that is built of gold. Glory to God. Hallelujah. For the king in all his splendor we shall soon behold. Glory to God, hallelujah. All the children of the Lord have a right to shout and sing. For the world is growing bright and our souls are on. 
on the wing. We are going by and by to the palace of the king. Where to God, hallelujah. And that last one there will shout redeeming mercy. Can you sing it that way? There will shout redeeming mercy. Here we go. There will shout redeeming mercy in a glad new song. Glory to God, hallelujah. There will sing the praise of Jesus with a blood wash fall. Glory to God, hallelujah. Oh, the children of the Lord have a right to shout and sing. For the world's growing bright and our souls are on the wing. We are going by and by to the palace of the king. Glory to God, hallelujah. Very good. Remain standing. Our men are coming this way. I wonder how many, how many for you that was the first time you shouted in church. <laughs> the first time that ever happened? That'd be something, wouldn't it? Very good. Hey, this, this place to shout. There's going to be thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people gathering in big circular stadiums all over the place today. And they're going to scream their lungs out because they're chasing a pigskin around the field, you know. <laughs> and some people last night said and watch cars make left turns all night long, you know, and they were shouting and screaming and all kinds of things. You wouldn't want to be anywhere near that crowd in some places, you know. <clears throat> Not everybody that goes is that way, but I'm just saying some people, you know, you wish you were sitting somewhere else, you know. But, uh, hey, we ought to get excited about the things of God. No doubt about that. Well, praise the Lord. I'm glad to see you. Brother Scott Beal, would you leave us in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day today, Lord, and we just thank you for the opportunity to be here together today. Fellowship under the words of, uh, of you, Lord, and I just uh, pray that you'd uh, take the offering that, uh, that we gather here today, and uh, I pray that you bless and multiply, Lord, and help us use it wisely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
take your hymnals once again, please, and turn to hymn number 15, Lead Me to Calvary. And would you stand, please, everyone, together, let us sing all four verses of hymn number 1-5. <laughs> take God's word and turn it with me to the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians in the fourth chapter, Ephesians chapter four. We're going to begin reading in just a moment in the seventh verse, Ephesians chapter four. We're going to read through the 16th verse as we continue in the series of messages we've been bringing now for the last several months concerning spiritual gifts. The book of Ephesians in the fourth chapter, we've looked at Romans chapter 12, and in the context of the list of gifts that we have there, we've looked at as well in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 at uh, those gifts that are listed there as well in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we've dealt with these particular passages. And now we come to uh, the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians. The apostle Paul, again, is the human penman. And he's writing concerning... Uh, these spiritual gifted individuals that we have here. The Bible says in verse number 7 of Ephesians chapter 4, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers 
for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, and to a perfect man, and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And I want you to notice, if you would, back in the 8th verse, the Bible says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. This is a quote, by the way, from the 68th Psalm, the 18th verse this particular verse, Paul quoting that psalm. But he says there he gave gifts unto men. In verse 7, he says, unto every one, if you notice there, every one of us, he's talking about these gifts that have been given, and we've been dealing with this subject of these gifts. And we've been looking for the last several months concerning what the gifts are, what their purpose is, why did Christ give us gifts? Do we have, do every, does every believer have a gift? And the answer is yes, there are, no, there are no spectators. There are no spectators in the work of the Lord. We are all to be actively engaged in the work of the Lord, in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether you're the preacher, whether you're an evangelist, whether you're a missionary, whether you're a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, doesn't matter. Every one of us have a responsibility to be involved in the work of God. And God has given us a particular gift. And you remember, we dealt with the fact that it's not so much, it's not so much that I absolutely merit down to this list that's given in Romans or this list that's given in 1 Corinthians or this list that's given in, in Ephesians chapter 4 and say, okay, it has to be one of these particular things, but... Uh, it could be it could be other it could be another gift that God has given to us and He's masterfully put it together like a painter puts together different colors and makes a beautiful painting. The Lord Jesus has done the same thing for you and I. And no two Christians are alike. Now they may have similar gifts, but no two Christians are exactly the same. And so God has placed you here. It is, it is my firm belief that God has placed you here where you're at, in the place that you're at, in the family that you were born into, in the location geographically that you are. He's placed you here for a specific purpose, for a reason. That no one else on this earth could fulfill. And so he's put you here for it. He's placed you here. And the question is this. The question is, are we willing to be used of God? If we are willing, there's no mistake about the fact, I believe in my own heart and my own mind, that God will show us what the gift is. We don't have to sit here and try to hunt it and search it. Now, we gave you a spiritual gifts test. If you remember way back in April, we gave you one of those spiritual gifts tests. And uh, it had, I don't know, I think it was about 50 questions, maybe more than that on there. And, different things, and it kind of gave you, you could score it at the end, it kind of gave you an idea of maybe the, uh, the leaning that you had towards a gift. Doesn't necessarily mean that that absolutely defined your gift, that was it, but it, it gave you some idea, it gave you some understanding concerning it. And that's what it was meant for, to give you an understanding of what we're dealing with. Now we come to this fourth chapter, and the Apostle Paul writing to this church at Ephesus, these believers. And he again reiterates the fact they've been given to every believer. He talks about what took place uh, from Calvary to his resurrection in verse uh, number 9 and verse number 10. And then really, he put that in parentheses there, a parenthetical expression, an understanding here. 
about what he did when he ascended on high and he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And then he says in the 11th verse, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And so we have this list here. Uh, five different offices, if you will, gifted individuals that God has given to the New Testament church. Now, in order to fully grasp what we're going to talk about, I, I want you just, for just a moment, I want you to go back with me and think about the unfolding drama of redemption. That's the title of a book that a man by the name of William uh, Graham Scroggie wrote. Great book. If you don't own it, you ought to get a copy of it. It is about five or six, seven hundred pages. You don't have to try to read it all in one sitting, by the way. Take a little bit at a time. And uh, when you eat meatloaf, you don't try to eat the whole loaf at one time, right? At least I hope you don't, anyway. You might have severe problems if you try to do that. But uh, the same way with books, you know, a little bit at a time. But it's a great book, and you ought to get a copy of it. I'm just putting a plug in for Mr. Scroggie. Now, let's think about that title, and let's just think about that thought for just a minute. The Unfolding Drama of Redemption. And we know that there are certain acts in a drama, and we're not talking about a television show here, of course. We're talking about what God is doing in this world. And we know that those different acts are actually splitting down even further into what we call different dispensations, different stewardships, and how God dealt with man. But I want you to think about, I want you to think about a couple different acts. First of all, let's, let's just say that act number one, and Mr. Scott didn't lay it out exactly like this, but similar. Let's just say act number one is this. It is a very prolonged period of time, thousands of years worth of time. Matter of fact, about somewhere around, if you believe the earth is about 6,000 years old, somewhere in that that time frame there. We believe in a, in a young earth as creationists. And uh, we believe that God created the heaven and the earth, right? No doubt about that. Genesis 1-1. And, uh, you know, that, that wraps it all up. That helps solve so many questions throughout the, the rest of the Bible, doesn't it? Just Genesis 1-1 does. Uh, but the first act would be from creation, the creation of the world, unto the birth of the world Savior. And that's a long period of time right there. And what was God doing that, during that period of time? He was preparing the world for the coming of His Son, for the coming Messiah of Israel. Uh, uh, that's all throughout the Old Testament. And there was, there, was a, there was a general theme that runs throughout the Old Testament. And I want you to see what that general theme is. Hold with, hold with me here in Ephesians 4. Put a, put a bookmark there, your finger, whatever the case may be. And look with me back in the book of Deuteronomy. Just one verse. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Here is a general theme of the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy chapter 6. One great primary truth, the primary theme and message of the Old Testament. Here it is, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now there are many themes and there are many messages in the Old Testament, but here's one general primary one. Uh, verse number 4, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That was the general theme that ran throughout the Old Testament. Now, you remember what happened to Israel? They got caught up in all types of idolatry throughout the Old Testament, didn't they? Uh, uh, now, God presented this great truth to a man uh, uh, by the name of Abraham. You remember that? And he called Abraham out of the earth of the Chaldees there in Genesis chapter 12. And he said, I'm going to take you to a land uh, uh, that, I, that I will show you. And by faith, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, that Abraham obeyed God and it was counted to him for righteousness sake and uh, God worked in his life in a great and miraculous way and uh, brought him out of, uh, uh, of Ur of the Chaldees where he worshipped false gods, a, a polytheistic society. That's what Ur of the Chaldees was. And then he brought him, uh, he brought him of course, to, to Canaan land and what he was doing there and how God worked in a marvelous and a mighty way there in Canaan. And so he set apart those people. He said in Genesis chapter 12 that in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed and through the nation of Israel they were to take this message of Genesis, or Deuteronomy 6-4 that the Lord our God is one Lord. Jehovah God is the only God. It's not through, uh, not through Allah. It's not through Buddha. It's not through all that. Hey, in that time it wasn't through uh, uh, Baal. It wasn't through uh, uh, Astaroth. It wasn't through Uber. Hey, look, it's God and God alone. And let me tell you something, Israel had a hard time learning that, but those years in captivity cured them of that. And when they came out of captivity, all those ten northern tribes from Assyrian captivity and the two southern tribes from Babylonian captivity, they were cured of it. Matter of fact, when they went in and Rome occupied them, they demanded of Rome that Caesar's 
uh, 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 standards be taken down, his flags and those types of things be taken down, and that his inscriptions come off the coins. They demanded that of them. And they obliged about that concerning that particular situation. That's Act 1. The Lord our God is one God. That's the thing. What about Act 2? Act 2 goes from uh, the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem until uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Now, think about this. In the Old Testament, God is there. He's in heaven. In the New Testament, God is here. He's on earth. He manifested himself in a body, didn't he? In the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God becomes uh, visible in man's word there in, in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and Jesus it took upon himself, the Bible says, Paul wrote, uh, he humbled himself and he became obedient to death, even the death of the cross, but he, he humbled himself in that he put on flesh. We call it his incarnation, right? He took that on and he was present in the world at that time, Paul said, For in him, that's in Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians 2, 9. Uh, you remember uh, when they were talking about what his name would be, they said they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So he's not only uh, before us as Savior, he's not only above us uh, uh, as a, a sovereign, but he is beside us as a Savior as well. Now, let me give you the third act, Act 3. And by the way, this is the act you and I live in, and the unfolding drama of redemption. This is the act you and I live in. And it's a, it's, it's, it's a very incredible time, because not only is God there, not only did he manifest himself here during his incarnation, but when he left, you know what he told those disciples? When I go away, remember he said, I will send you a comforter. And he shall abide with you forever. Here's the great truth. Not only is God there, but God is in us. And the Holy Spirit of God. This time period is going to last uh, uh, from uh, 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 when the Spirit came there uh, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 until the rapture of the church. And by the way, through these different acts, we can see the, the revelation of the Trinity. God the Father revealed as one God. The Lord our God is one God. God the Son revealing Himself in human history. And God the Spirit, God in us in this, this age. What are we? The Bible says we are the body of Christ. We're the body of Christ. So we are, uh, uh, really, we are the testimony of God in this world. That's what you and I are. Because in us dwells the Holy Spirit of God. If the Holy Spirit doesn't dwell inside of you, the Bible says you're none of His. I'm glad that He abides inside of us. So Act 1, God is 1. Act 2, God becomes man. Act 3, God is in man. That's redemptive history. There's another act coming, and that's after the rapture until the eternal state, and that will be when the Lord Jesus Christ returns in the rapture of the seven years of tribulation, and then he'll return, and we'll return with him to this earth, and he'll set his feet on the Mount of Olives, it'll cleave asunder, he'll set up his millennial kingdom, and we'll rule and reign with him for a thousand years. Now, the Holy Spirit lives in the body of Christ, which is who? You and I as believers. We're the body of Christ. Now, why do I say all that? Because in the first act of human history, God was doing what? God was manifesting himself. He was making himself known. In the second act, God was doing what? He was making himself known. In the fourth act that is yet to come, God is going to do what? He's going to make himself known when he visibly returns back to this earth. But let me tell you something. You know, in this very act that you and I are living in, what do you think God wants to do? He wants to manifest himself. He wants to manifest himself. And how is he going to do that? He is only going to do that through you and I as we are Christ-like in this world. That's how that's going to take place. Now, we've just seen here, uh, uh, back in our text in the book of Ephesians, uh, the Bible says that every Christian has been given a gift. Uh, and to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So every last one of us as believers have a gift. And uh, we are gifted for a particular ministry to do what? To, to equip, to energize, uh, uh, to build up, uh, uh, to serve, uh, uh, to bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ and to serve his body. That's why we've been gifted. And many of these gifts are, th th these gifts were just that. They were gifts. They're stewardships. I don't own it. It's something that God has given to me to be used 
uh, uh, for him. Now I want you to think about here this morning in particular, there are some gifted individuals that God gave to the New Testament church. Look at verse 11 of Ephesians chapter 4 again. The Bible says he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now, he desires for us to use these gifts to bring honor to him and to edify the body. So he says, I'm, I'm going to give you some gifted men. I'm going to give you some leadership, some people who are able to take charge to help you to, to minister the gifts. These are not gifts themselves, but they are gifted people that God has given to the church. Five categories. We're going to deal with just the first two this morning and the last three next Sunday. The first two... The, the, first of all, let, let's talk about this for just, just a moment. The position, the position is a position of leadership. That's their position. They have a, they have their, their focus, their focus is on giving leadership to the local church, to giving instruction to the body of Christ. Now, let me give you not only their focus, but let me give you these foundational offices that are mentioned here first: the apostles and the prophets. And I want you to hear me out on this. The apostles and the prophets. The first question probably that comes to mind is, who are they? Who are the apostles? Uh, are they still in existence today? Are there still apostles today? Well, let's look, if you would, in the Gospel of Mark. Will you turn over the Gospel of Mark with me for just a minute? Mark chapter 3. There's a uniqueness to this office of an apostle. There's a uniqueness I believe it's given really in, in two different phases, if you will. There's a primary and then there's a secondary. A primary and a secondary. As studying and reading about this, this entire week, and of course before that as well, I've read and studied about this. I believe there's, there's two things. There's, there's primary and there's secondary apostles. I want you to look with me in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 3, Mark chapter 3. And verse number 13. Notice what the Bible says here. And he goes up into a mountain and calls unto him whom he would. And they came unto him and he ordained twelve that they should be with him. And that he might send them forth to preach. And to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. Verse 16. And Simon he surnamed Peter and James the son of Zebedee. And John the brother of James. And he surnamed them Bermadres which is the sons of thunder. And Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and they went into an house. Now we have what is typically called here, throughout the Word of God, you'll see this, the twelve. The twelve. We refer to them as the twelve disciples. Almost synonymously, we refer to them as the twelve apostles as well. And so we have a primary office here. What was their responsibility? Well, the Bible tells us what it was. Here it is, verse 14. At the end, that he might send them forth to what? To preach, verse 15, to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. So there were 12. We know Judas was a traitor. We know the story of what happened to him. He went out and he took his own life. And then in Acts chapter 1, they replaced him uh, with a man by the name of Matthias. And before... You jump on the bandwagon and get mad at that early church for replacing Judas. And some people get upset and think they should have waited and, and Paul would have been the twelfth one. Well, the fact of the matter is that nowhere do you see the Lord rebuke those men for doing what they did. Nowhere throughout the Word of God do you see them rebuke it. Kind of high and lofty for us to rebuke them, right? I think we have some, some corner on the thing. That's just for your own benefit. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Uh, they were an official group. They had a they had a basic task to preach the gospel. They were authoritative. They originally witnesses. They were with the Lord Jesus Christ. They were going to preach a message that no one in the history of the world had ever preached before. It was the message of Jesus Christ. And when they finished, when they were done, they were off the scene. Now we know that the apostle Paul also was called. An apostle. Look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He was not any less than Peter, not any less than James, not any less than John. Uh, uh, look in 2 Corinthians 11, and notice what the Bible says here.
The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 1, Paul's writing, of course, Would to God you could bear with me a little of my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted by the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom, you have not, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. For I suppose I was not a whip behind the very chiefest, what? Apostles. Apostles. So Paul fits in that category of being one of these primary apostles, giving a total with Matthias and Paul making 13. 13 of these primary apostles. These primary apostles are people who heard and who saw the Lord, they saw him physically after his resurrection, a manifestation of Jesus Christ. And what did they do? They declared him to others. Now you say, Preacher, where do you get that from? Well, look with me, if you would, in 1 John chapter 1. Just the opening verses of 1 John. John, the apostle, the human penman, writing this letter, notice what he said. Verse 1, we're going to read down through verse 3. 1 John 1, 1, that which, we, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the Lord Jesus. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his son, Jesus Christ. He's talking about we, we handled him, we saw him, we walked with him, we talked with him, we heard him, we were in his presence. Who is the we? The we are the apostles. We saw him. We were there. We, we saw him manifested in our presence. Now I want you to go to another passage, just a little bit from where you're at there, First Peter, if you would, just a couple pages back, First Peter chapter 1. The Bible says in verse number 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that faith not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, willing to greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaven as through manifold temptations. But the trial of your faith be much more precious and of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise, and to praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now notice verse 8. Whom, having not seen, you love, in whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now there are those who may say that they have succeeded directly from the apostles themselves, that there's, they are an apostle in the primary sense of the word that's given here. That they've, but the Bible says, Peter said, look, of whom you have not seen. You haven't seen him. More scripture bears credence to that if you look in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, if you turn over there with me. Acts, in the first chapter, they're going to pick this Replacement for Judas in Acts chapter 1. And the Bible says, verse 21, Wherefore, <clears throat> of these men which have come with us all the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Of these men, he said in verse 21, which have company with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. And then he said in verse 23, and they appointed two Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, 
and Matthias, and they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. And we know that the Bible says in the 26th verse, they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias. He was numbered with the eleven apostles. And so here is one. An apostle is one who heard and who saw the Lord Jesus Christ, and he declared unto others. Their ministry was authoritative. Their ministry was original. Their, their ministry was a miraculous testimony uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's primary apostles. Now, there are, there are, I believe, secondary apostles. Secondary apostles. This may be something new for you. You haven't thought about this before. Maybe you thought there, that was just it. But look with me, if you would, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. There were others throughout the New Testament that were called apostles. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 23. The Bible says, Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you, or our brethren be inquired of, they are the messengers. Guess what that word is in the Greek? Apostles, same word we get. Messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. If you wanted to take these and instead of saying primary apostles and secondary apostles, I guess you could say there are the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, those 13, and then, then there are the apostles, as Paul puts it here to the church at Corinth, the apostles of the churches. Now, who are these men? They'd be men like uh, are listed in Romans chapter 16, men by the names of Adronicus and Junius. James, the brother of our Lord, was mentioned uh, as an apostle in Galatians 1.19. Barnabas was mentioned as an apostle in Acts 14.14. 14. Uh, not necessarily commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ himself personally, physically, uh, uh, maybe not have seen the post-resurrected Christ as the twelve, but they were simply messengers of the gospel, messengers of the truth. Now, we also know that that particular office, those, uh, those, church, those apostles of the churches, those secondary apostles, were also forfeited because Paul, counterfeited, excuse me, because Paul warned about those in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Satan sowed in false apostles as well. 2 Corinthians 11, verse number 13. So these two categories. And what do these apostles do? Their primary ministry was to move around to preach the gospel uh, to give forth the word of God, the truth, and uh, that's what they did in those early years of the New Testament church. That was their responsibility. Now, the primary group, the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, not a self-perpetuating group. Take, for instance, when James was killed, no one was appointed to take this place as an apostle in the book of Acts. So when they died... When they passed off the scene, no one took their places. There was no primary apostolic succession. You don't see that anywhere. They had a nine, those primary apostles, those apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, had a non-transferable commission given directly by Jesus Christ himself. And when they died, that was it. They were used to do what? They were used to establish a foundation of doctrine from the basic patterns uh, uh, of the New Testament church. They were mobile. They were always moving around. They didn't stay necessarily in one general location. They moved around. And when they ceased, the New Testament was finished and the pattern of the church was established. Now, they had some unique abilities that were given to them. These apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, these primary apostles. What were some of them? Well, let's look, if you would, in the book of Acts for just a minute. Acts chapter 5. Turn over there with me, if you would, for just a moment. Acts chapter 5. These were a unique group for a unique period of history, laying down that doctrinal foundation, establishing a pattern for the New Testament church. The Bible says in Acts 5, 15, and so much that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folk and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. They had this ministry of uh, 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 miracles that were given to them. Now, I ask you a question. 
Why did they have that ministry? Why did they have that ministry? They had that ministry because when that miraculous event took place, what do you think happened? Just the shadow of Peter, the Bible says in verse 15, cast upon one that was ill, uh, 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 blood here and there. Uh, what do you think that did? Do you think uh, people stayed away from that, or do you think people gathered around that? They gathered around that, didn't they? They naturally did. Uh, uh, by the way, we have false prophets today and false apostles, and when they lay claim to do certain things, what do you see around those types of people? A great crowd gathered around those types of people, don't they? So great crowds gathered around the Lord Jesus, but they gathered around, and it presented an opportunity to do what? To heal a lot of more people? Is that what it did? Or they were more healed? But what was the reason why the miracle took place? To bring the crowd to preach the gospel. The Bible says, following those things, many believed because the truth was being preached. Remember, they didn't have a completed revelation as you and I do. They didn't have the completed New Testament as you and I do. Now, you may ask, you may ask this morning, well, preacher, what about the missionary today? Isn't, uh, isn't, he, isn't he an apostle? I believe he is in the general sense of the word, in that secondary, an apostle of the church, uh, because it means this, it simply means a messenger, one who is sent. That's what the word apostle means. Let's bring it down and let's make the application to you and I. The truth of the matter is, as believers, you and I, in the secondary sense of that word, are sent ones as well. We are sent, we are to be messengers of the gospel of Jesus Christ in this world right where we live. There's applications to be made today. I wonder, I wonder, are we faithfully, are we faithfully giving out the message of Jesus Christ? Well, the apostles, what else? There's another gifted man that's listed here in Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. And what is this gifted one? And uh, that's the office of prophet. You have apostles, you have prophets. These are foundational offices of gifted men in the local church. So who are, who are the prophets? We've talked a little bit about prophecy. Prophets, really, it simply means this, one who speaks out. That's what a prophet is. One who proclaims. Now, when we think of a prophet, we think of, we think of old Elijah who comes into Ahab and says, I tell you what, it's not going to rain for three and a half years. That's what we think of as a prophet. What was he doing when he did that? He was foretelling what God had told him, right? He received direct revelation from God, and God said, you go tell, you tell old Ahab that's what's going to happen. And so he received direct revelation, and we think that's it. We think that's all a prophet does. It's somebody who just received direct revelation from God. But a prophet is one who proclaims, who speaks out the message of God. That's what a prophet is. <clears throat> So, it's not just a revelatory gift, as we've talked about in the past, uh, but it is proclaiming, speaking forth the word of God. The prophet uh, was one uh, whom someone said this. This is what they do. Uh, they gave God a voice in the world. They gave God a voice in the world. So, what's the difference between an apostle and a prophet? You say a prophet's supposed to proclaim, an apostle's sent with a message. So, well, what's the difference there? Well, in some cases, there was no difference. Paul was considered both. Peter was considered both. However, uh, uh, there is a difference in their office. A prophet, uh, instead of being itinerant as an apostle was, a prophet remained in a local ministry. He remained in the local church there. Uh, the, Paul, we see him mentioned as a prophet. And what do we see him mentioned as a prophet as? He, we see him mentioned in Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Where's he at? He's there laboring and serving in the churches in Antioch. He had a localized ministry there of proclaiming the truth of God. Uh, <clears throat> what else did a prophet do? Not only to remain in a local ministry, but he spoke revelation from God. He spoke revelation from God. They had a, a, a very distinct message. It was a message of the revelation of God. We think about Paul and Peter and John the Baptist. They spoke revelation from God. And then what did they do? They taught the apostles' doctrine. They taught the apostles' doctrine. Uh, we see that as well in the church of Antioch in Acts chapter 13. So every time they opened their mouth, they weren't necessarily predicting future events as we think that that's the way it all went. That's not necessarily the case. They spoke for God, sometimes by direct revelation, like we were talking about there with Elijah, and sometimes based on what they already received and heard 
from the apostles they spoke that. So that office as it stands has passed away, but that gift continues on. The gift of prophecy, the gift of proclaiming the truth of God. Now they had a duty. What was their duty? What was their function, if you will? Their function was to give revelation to the local church. That was their function. They had a ministry of exhortation. The Bible says that it was confirmed, probably by uh, uh, some sort of miracles it was confirmed, their ministry among them. Remember again, uh, uh, no completed revelation at this time. Didn't have what you and I have in the New Testament here. Uh, look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 for just a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We find in the church at Corinth there's no indication of apostles other than Paul being there to start the church. But there were prophets. Notice the localized responsibility here. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 29. Let the prophets speak two or three and let the other judge. Then verse number 32. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Two things I want you to think about here in these passages. First of all, Revelation that was given to the apostles was doctrinal revelation for the foundation of the church. Revelation that was given to the prophets was practical revelation in the everyday, ongoing affairs of the local church. So the apostles laid the, uh, laid the doctrinal basis and the prophets gave uh, the practical advice uh, to the local church. Uh, then, not only that, we see that there was subjection. Same passage, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. What's Paul saying? The things that I have written as an apostle are the commandments of the Lord. These are the words of God. So the prophets were subject then. They were in subjection uh, to the apostles. Why is all this going on? The church is an infant church. They need the practical principles. They need to know what was coming in the future. They were babes in Christ. And the, the prophets had that vital ministry of communicating these practical truths uh, uh, to the local church. Now, let me sum this up. Three functions that the apostles and the prophets had. First of all, it, it, we can use one word for each one of those. First of all, it was foundational. Foundational. So where do we get that from, Pastor? We'll look back in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. Foundational ministry. Ephesians 2 Verse number 20. The Bible is speaking about the household of God there, and there's no strangers or foreigners. They're all fellow citizens in verse 19. And then he says in verse 20, and are, and are built upon the foundation of what? The apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. By the way, the book of Hebrews the apostle, Jesus was called the apostle there. He was definitely sent as a messenger, was he not? No doubt about that. So it's foundation. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, the apostles and the prophets, building upon that foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ, they had that responsibility of laying that foundation. Foundation. Not only that, revelation. Revelation. They were God's mouthpiece to reveal His truth. How? Doctrinally and practically. You're there in chapter 2 of Ephesians. Turn one page over to chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. That's what the Bible says. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto His holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So you have foundation, the foundational reason. You have revelation, giving out doctrinal and practical truths. And then you have confirmation, the gifts and the abilities, such as were mentioned in Hebrews chapter 2, such as were mentioned in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, to do miracles to confirm their revelation. So these foundational offices, their purpose was to establish the church with sound doctrine. Now I want you to go back, and I'm, I'm about to bring everything to a to a conclusion here. I want you to go back to what we began with. If you remember, God set forth a standard all the way back in the Old Testament. And God's standard was set forth in the same chapter where we began 
as the theme of the Old Testament, the Lord our God is one Lord. He set forth the standard there. He set forth this standard of obedience to His Word. That was the standard. And it is no less the standard today. It was no less the standard for those foundational offices of apostles and prophets. Can I tell you something? If we are going to proclaim the truth, which we have a responsibility to do, and if we are going to be sent forth as messengers of Jesus Christ, as apostles of His church today, then we are going to have to heed and be obedient to His Word in our own lives. If we're going to manifest as God did in the Old Testament, as He did while He was on this earth, in the Gospel records, in His life and ministry, He Himself manifested who He was here on this earth. And He has left you and I here during what we call this church age, this age of grace. He has left us here to manifest His testimony. Let me tell you how it's going to be done. It's still going to be done by obeying what we find in His Word. It's still going to come down, it all boils down to our obedience to the truth of Scripture. Now there's a reason God gave these offices. We'll talk about it more on next time. It's found there in verse 12. The Bible says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. But let me tell you something. We will never get to these areas right here and no gifted man in any church will be able to help in these areas until, first of all, we as the body of Christ are willing to say, I am going to represent Christ in this world by being an obedient Christian to the Word of God. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We're going to pray together in just a moment. I wonder, I want you to think about, as you sit there quietly, We know that God wants us to respond to His Word in obedience. How do you respond to it? Now listen, I, I'm not talking about the things that are easy because all of us have things in our life that it's easy for us to be obedient to. But I'm talking about when God asks you to do something that goes against your grain and maybe you listen, you listen to the voices of the world that are clamoring for you. We talked about that in my Sunday school class. There's two voices, the voices of the world and the voices of wisdom. And sometimes we listen to the voices of the world. We, we, give in, we give in to those sinners who try to entice us. And God said, consent thou not, and we give in to it. I wonder, is your response to God's word, even when it points out some sin in your life, is your response obedience? Is your response to say, thank you, Lord, I needed that, forgive me of that sin, cleanse me, Help me be thoroughly right with you. Let me tell you something. You cannot be the Christian that you ought to be, and this church cannot be the church that God has designed for it to be as a testimony for Jesus Christ in this world if you are not living in obedience to His truth. Now, I, I, I don't want... I'm giving my own personal testimony. God, forgive me and help me. Cleanse me. I don't want to hinder the testimony of God in this world by something in my life that I'm not willing to ask God to forgive me and to repent of and get right with Him. Now what about you? Message really simple. Are you an obedient Christian in every area? Look, if we're going to manifest Christ if we're going to manifest Him, if we're, going to be, if we're going to be used, if our gifts are going to be used of God for the glory of Jesus Christ and the edification of this body, then there's going to have to be, as we, we sing a hymn, nothing between my soul and the Savior, none of this world's delusive dream. I have renounced all sinful pleasure. Jesus is mine. There's nothing between. I'm wondering, could you honestly, could you honestly sing that this morning and say nothing between? Nothing. If not, why don't you say, you know, I, I don't want to hinder. I don't want to clog up the channel of what God desires to do in this local church. And I want to be thoroughly right with my Savior. And why don't you bring that to Christ today? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are